city on Mars as uh, soon as possible. Um, I mean, I'm optimistic about the future on Earth, but uh, it's important to have life insurance for life as a whole. Is it going to be a business kind of tourism in, in, in orbit, or is it uh, more a kind of plan B if things on Earth do not develop as well? It's not exactly a plan B. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's more that I think, I think there's two, two aspects to this. Uh, one is that we want to have a future that is inspiring and exciting. And what are the things that you find inspiring and exciting about the future? And I think one, a future where we are a space-faring civilization and out there among the stars, I think that's, every kid gets excited about that. You don't even need to teach them. They, they just get, it's like instinctive. And so we, we, it's very important for us to have reasons to, like reasons to be excited about life. Like when you wake up in the morning, it can't just be about problems. It's <laughs> okay. I know everyone in this room deals with a lot of tough problems, but you know it's got to be more than that. <laughs> so, you know, I think a future where you can say, "Hey, even if it's not you, there's, there's going to be people out there. They're going to we can have a base on the moon. We're going to have a you know a city on Mars. Maybe go further, the moons of Jupiter and everything." I think that's a very exciting future, and and then, and I think most people do. Um, And you seriously want to be buried on Mars? <laughs> Just not on impact. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to... Uh, listen, we're all going to die someday. Um, so if you're going to die someday, I'm like, okay, do you want to be buried on Mars or Earth? I'm like, Mars sounds cool. Born on Earth, die on Mars. That's, uh, you know, if you've got the choice. Um, Two years ago, I had a conversation with uh, Jack Ma, uh, and we spoke about Jeff Bezos' plans with regard to uh, orbit. And he uh, said, well, let's uh, Jeff Bezos take care uh, for the orbit. I take care for the Earth. You seem to take care for both? Yeah, basically, Tesla is about trying to make sure things are good for the future on Earth. And then SpaceX is about... Uh, good future beyond Earth, basically. Um, and so, obviously, we have to have sustainable energy, uh, both consumption and production of, of energy. Uh, so, like Tesla does solar panels and batteries. I think that's one of the key uh, ways to have sustainable energy generation. And also, the batteries are useful for wind power. So, that, and then, that elect, you, then you need to consume it via, you consume the electricity, so electric vehicles. Um, and, um, You know, I think you look at these things like say, okay, if you look back from the future and say, what's the fundamental good of uh, Tesla, I would say it's probably should be assessed as by how many by how many years did Tesla accelerate the advent of sustainable energy? Like that's like I would measure the goodness of Tesla in that in that way. And then for SpaceX, it's like okay, to what degree did we improve the probability of humanity being a space-faring civilization? I remember very well the year 2014 when we were hosting the gold steering wheel here at uh, Axel Springer and you got the uh, award for lifetime achievement and I was sitting in the first row with the then very successful and famous uh, CEO of a very big German car company and I asked him while you were on stage, isn't this guy dangerous for you? I mean, this looks really serious. He said, oh no, don't worry. First of all, the whole idea of uh, electric driving, it's never going to be a mass market. Sure. Second, these guys, that a lot. <laughs> these guys in Silicon Valley, they have no clue about engineering, about building really beautiful and great cars, so we don't have to worry. Uh, by then, Tesla's market cap was 23 billion. Uh, today it's 536 <laughs> billion US dollars. <laughs> the market cap of VW then was 86 and to today it's 77. And so you could, uh, you, you are with Tesla, Tesla two and a half times bigger than BMW, VW, and Daimler. I even have said you the stock ever, is too high. I mean, what am I supposed to do? You know, like, have, have you ever considered said to buy? The stock is too high a long time, like when it was like $800 pre, pre split. And they don't listen, they don't listen to me, but you know, I tell you. And the SEC complained again. I mean, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> is it a serious option to buy one of the incumbents, one of the big car companies for you? Well, I think it, we're definitely not going to launch a hostile takeover. So I suppose if there was some... But a friendly one. If somebody said, hey, we think it would be a good idea to merge with Tesla, we'd certainly have that conversation. Mm. Um, but, you know, we don't want to... 
get up, yeah, hostile, hostile takeover sort of situation. Did you feel uh, a lot of complacency uh, these days that uh, the incumbents then uh, let you feel that you are, I mean, the kind of hopeless disruptor, but they know how to do it, or were they very polite and nice with you? Do you mean back then? Or back now? then? Oh, uh, no, no. Today, were, everybody was super nice. Though. I would not say they were super no. Yeah, they were difficult to characterize their response as super nice. Um, uh, they used a lot of adjectives. Um, <laughs> I don't think that any of them were positive. <laughs> so, did um, it, did it yeah, we, tried, we really tried hard to convince a lot of companies. Uh, Honestly, I was in so many panels, uh, but um, they generally was yeah. Generally, the sentiment that was expressed that you mentioned earlier that was pretty much universal. Mm. Uh, especially uh, if back in say two thousand eight or two thousand seven, like when we first unveiled the roads in two thousand seven. Um, yeah, I mean it was just basically uh, they just said, oh, "Well, you're." basically a bunch of fools. Uh, well, I mean, generally, I would say, like, well, who, starting a car company is crazy. You're, you're going to lose all your money. I was like, I think I probably will lose all my money. I agree. Mm. I, it wasn't like I thought it would be successful. I thought we had maybe a 10% chance of success. Mm. So then people would say, you're, it's going to fail and you're going to lose lose everything. I was like, yeah, probably true. Yeah. So what else is new? A couple of years ago, we, 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 we uh, saw each other in, in America and a guy asked you on a panel uh, when uh, uh, autonomous driving will be approved. And you said, I do not care so much when it's going to be approved. I care more when uh, human beings in cars will be forbidden. And then the guy said, well, it's only really unrealistic. Uh, it's never going to happen in, uh, 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 in cars. People want to do something actively. And then you said, well... Hundred years ago, uh, nobody could imagine uh, elevator without a lift boy. Today, nobody yeah. could imagine a lift with a lift boy. Yeah. So when is autonomous driving really, really going to happen? And when when are you able uh, to do it? And when is it going to be approved? Okay, just between us. Yeah, um, that's a very discreet <laughs> circle here. Yeah. Um, so well, first of all, I'm not I'm not against people driving. To be clear, uh, so I think. People will drive cars basically as far into the future as I can imagine. Uh, it's just that it's going to be increasingly unusual to, to drive your own car. Um, and while it's fun to drive, uh, you know, a, a well handling car on a winding road in beautiful terrain, of course that's that's fun. Um, but it's not fun to drive a car in uh, terrible gridlock traffic. Like you know, going through extreme traffic, that's no fun driving a car. So. I think people are unlikely to, most of the time, want to commute or with with their uh, and drive themselves. Um, and you know, t people are typically spending an hour and a half a day, maybe two hours uh, on average driving, um, especially say in like California or something like that. It's very common. Um, and some people will, will actually commute like three hours a day. Sometimes it's pretty crazy. So. Uh, so I, so I think, I think uh, um, if you say fast forward to like 10 years from now, I think 10 years from now, almost all cars will be will have full autonomy capability. Uh, that new, all new cars produced. So there's there's about two billion cars and trucks in the in the existing fleet, um, and the new vehicle production is about five percent of the fleet size. So about 100 million. Uh, so even the point at which all cars are autonomous, it'll still take, you know, 20 years to replace all the cars, assuming that the number of cars and trucks, trucks in the fleet stays constant. Um, but if I say 10 years from now, I would say vast majority of cars electric, like maybe 70, 80 percent or more, uh, and uh, almost all cars autonomous. Electric autonomy is the absolutely the future, no question. It's just a question of when. Um, uh, but then, like I said. Sometimes people think that that means the, the global fleet gets replaced instantly. It's like, nope, you have to go 20 years beyond that point before, uh, it, 20 years from the point at which all cars are, new cars are electric, then the fleet will be replaced. Um, this is just an important, uh, it's not like, some people are used to like mobile phones and that kind of thing, it's like two year or three year replacement rate, but cars are a much uh, more expensive asset to lo longer life. Uh, anyway, to, to actually answer your question, um, 
I'm, I'm extremely confident uh, of achieving full autonomy uh, and, and releasing it to the Tesla customer base uh, next year. Now, the, that there's a uncertain period of time for when regulatory approval will be will take. You know, how long will it take? But I think if you are able to accumulate uh, billions of kilometers of autonomous driving, then it's difficult to argue and, and look at the accident rate uh, when the car is autonomous versus non-autonomous. And in fact, our, our statistics already show a massive difference when the car is on autopilot or not on autopilot. If the safety is much greater even with the current autopilot software. And we are discussing level five autonomy, so really yes. full autonomy. Will yes. Europe lag behind or will it be approved here at the same time like in America or China? It's hard to say uh, exactly when it will be approved. Um, I, I mean, just to, to and our customers already know this, but the, the, the EU regulators are the most conservative. Mm. Um, and. Uh, I don't know if people want that to be the case or not. Our customers are sort of unhappy about it. But, um, yeah, they only meet every six months. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, a bit of a yeah. Maybe meet more often, I don't know. Um, so, I, yeah, but I think at least some jurisdictions will allow full self-driving uh, next year. Okay. Exactly a year ago, you were announcing in this very building uh, that you're planning to build a new uh, site uh, near Berlin. Yeah. Um, and uh, a couple of months later, in June, you started. You want to finish it by July next year. We, we did a little tour this morning. It's impressive how advanced it is and uh, it's almost unbelievable. Germany, and particularly, particularly Berlin, is not world famous for finishing construction sites in time and in budget. Uh, yeah. So you've created a kind of anti-Berlin uh, airport project. Why Berlin? Why did you go to Germany and to Berlin to get that big project done? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm actually a big fan of Germany. I, I love Germany. It's great. I, you know, um, I have a lot of friends, um, uh, German friends, and. Uh, I think Berlin is a very fun city, um, and uh, I think it's there's, there's also it's, from a location standpoint, uh, people like say y young people can live in apartments at a reasonable price in, in the city of Berlin. Uh, but if somebody's got a family, they can still have an affordable house. So it's a good location, offering um, you know good living for people of, of all ages and uh, incomes and. and uh, uh, Berlin is mayor once said Berlin is poor but sexy. Is yeah. that what attracted you? Um, well, it's not that poor, but, <laughs> but it's definitely sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to have like uh, when we open the. Uh, you're all invited, by the way. Uh, <laughs> when we have the opening for Giga Berlin, we're going to have uh, just a big party. Um, you know, we're going to have like start off from the day, have more sort of family music. Uh, And, uh, and then gradually get more hardcore and then go, you know, midnight techno till dawn. Do, <laughs> do you plan to spend more time in Berlin yourself? You want to partly live here? If it, uh, yes, uh, we'll be spending a lot of time here. Where do you sleep tonight? In the, in the, tonight's in the factory. In, a, in the factory? Not uh, in well, time. technically a conference room in the factory, but yeah. You sleep in a conference room in the not finished factory tonight? Yeah, it gives me a good feel for what's going on. Alone or? Uh, yeah, I assume so. <laughs> Is this an invitation? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, Elon, you have so many uh, projects. It's not only Tesla or SpaceX, it's Neuralink, uh, it's the boring company, uh, uh, so many things. And when we discussed last time, I asked you what is the most important project or the most important topic for you to deal with in the foreseeable future. And you said that is truly the role that AI is going to play in our society. Could you explain yeah. why and why that is a big opportunity, but also seems to worry you. Uh, yeah, I think, well, I mean, humans have been the smartest creature on Earth for a long time, and that is going to change with uh, what's typically called artificial general intelligence. Uh, so this is, say, an AI that is uh, smarter than a human in every way, could, could even simulate a human. Uh, so, uh, 
you know, th- th- this is something we should be concerned about. I think there should be uh, government oversight of uh, AI developments, um, especially super advanced AI. It's just this is anything that is a potential uh, danger to the public. We generally agree that this should have uh, government oversight to ensure that the the public safety is taken care of. Because uh, you feel that one day uh, the uh, uh, mankind could surf the machines and not the other way around. Honestly, when I see people on their phones, I think we're already serving Sadly the machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like everyone's uh, answering the questions. You know, every time you do a search or add information, you're sort of building this the the, the digital group mind. Um, but yeah, uh, it, the advent of artificial general intelligence is called the singularity for a reason because. Just like a black hole, which is a singular singularity, it's difficult to predict what will happen. Um, so it's not as though the advent of AGI is necessarily bad, but it's bad as one of the possible outcomes. And when is singularity in the in the definition of uh, Ray Kurzweil going to happen? Um, well, I think you're saying he, he he's predicting 2025. I think that's uh, reasonably accurate. Mm -hmm. And how can it be avoided that is then uh, more a threat for humanity than an opportunity? Is it a question of governance so that there is not too much power yeah. in one or in few hands? Or how would, you, yeah. how would you make sure that it goes into the right direction? I think we should have uh, a government oversight, just like we do. We have uh, government oversight and regulation of uh, cars and aircraft and uh, food and pharmaceuticals. These are all... Uh, you know, there's a there are regulators that oversee uh, these developments to ensure public safety, um, and I think uh, yeah, auto, uh, digital superintelligence would also be potentially a public safety risk, and so it should be. It's, I think it's very important to for uh, regulators to keep an eye on that. Who should own the data data by then? I think everyone should own their own data. Like individuals should own their data. Um, And I certainly shouldn't be tricked by some terms and conditions of a website and suddenly you don't own your data. That's crazy. Uh, who reads those terms and conditions anyway? So, uh, but I think it's just, you know, like we wouldn't let people develop uh, a nuclear bomb in the backyard just for the hell of it, you know. That, that seems crazy. So, digital superintelligence, I think, has the potential to be more dangerous than a nuclear bomb. So, yeah, we should uh, just... Somebody should be keeping an eye. So we can't have the inmates running the asylum here. Which is a global uh, issue, because if we do well, but uh, China has other rules and uh, a different regulatory framework, uh, that is another uh, yeah, I don't, I don't challenge. Think, yeah, I, I generally, that this is one of the rebuttals I get from those developing AI. And Tesla is also developing a form of AI with self-driving, but it's a very narrow form of AI, just mm -hmm. like... Um, it, like the car's not going to wake up Sunday one day and take over the world. Um, so, so it's, it's uh, but but the, the rebuttal I guess like well you know China's going to have unfettered uh, AI development and so if, if we have regulations and that slows us down then China will have it. And I'm like look I, from my conversations with uh, government officials in China they are they they they're quite concerned about AI as well and they. Uh, In fact, they're probably more likely to have a good oversight than, I think, other countries. What is the biggest uh, challenge uh, ahead of us, in general, not only with regard to AI? What is the biggest problem that needs to be solved? What, what's the biggest threat to, to humanity's future or something? Uh, hmm. Well... AI is certainly a, one of the biggest risks. It could be the biggest risk. Um, I think we need to watch out about uh, population collapse. This is uh, somewhat counterintuitive to most people. Uh, they think that, well, there's so many humans, maybe too many humans. Uh, but that's just because they live in a city. Uh, if you're in an aircraft and you look down, they say if you dropped a, a cannonball, how often would you hit a person? Basically never. In fact, the stuff falling in from space all the time. Natural meteorites, old rocket stages, all the time. Um, 
but nobody worries about it because the the actual it, in fact it um there's a good web, a, a cool website called Wait But Why and this guy Tim Urban like he actually just did the math and and uh, all humans on Earth uh, could fit in the city of New York on one floor. Don't even need the upper floors. So that's actually the cross section of of humans as seen from Earth is extremely tiny, basically vanishingly small, almost nothing. Um, so we need to watch out about population collapse. Um, Slow, low growth rate, I think, is um, a, a big risk, um, and it's also not exactly top secret. You can go look at the Wikipedia, you know, growth rate. So, and, and, and this this is actually this this is this is definitely the civilization as with a with a whimper not a bang, uh, because it, it would be a sad ending um, where the the average age becomes very high, and really the youth are effectively uh, de facto enslaved to take care of the old people. This is not a good way to go end. Do you have any new projects dealing with these topics that you've just addressed? Um, well, I'm trying to set a good example on the kid front. <laughs> Six kids. Yes. Um, <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, How much time do you spend with them? Uh, I, I spend about as much time as they want to spend with me. So, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, they're not. Uh, well, one's just a baby, and the others are fourteen and sixteen, and uh, teenagers um, don't usually want to hang out with their parents that much, you know. You know, we just had Thanksgiving weekend, so all, all the kids were over. Um, so you know, they they have spent. If they want to spend more time with me, I say, like, oh, you should, I actually ask them, are you sure you don't want to hang out more? And they're like, no. So uh, I think it's probably the right amount then, since they, that's my, the, they don't want to hang out more. Um, so I think we really should take this seriously, the population collapse, artificial intelligence, obviously sustainable energy is important. Uh, the faster we transition to sustainable energy, the less uh, of a gamble we're taking with climate. And... Um, I, th I think there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs on the medical front, uh, particularly around synthetic uh, mRNA. Uh, you can basically do anything with uh, synthetic uh, RNA, DNA. Um, it's, really, it's like a computer program. So, I mean, I think with enough, with, with, uh, with effort, that's not too crazy. You could probably stop aging, reverse it if you want. Um, uh, these are, you can basically do it. You can turn someone into a freaking butterfly if you want with the right DNA sequence. So, I mean, caterpillars do it. So, uh, But your project Neuralink is in a way empowering human intelligence versus artificial intelligence. That's the purpose yeah. of it. Is that correct? Yeah, so Neuralink, the, 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 uh, in, the, in the short to medium term, Neuralink is really just going to um, help cure... Uh, brain injuries, mm -hmm. brain and spine injuries. So it's like if if somebody is a. In fact, our, our first uh, implanted devices in humans will be for uh, quadriplegics, tetraplegics, allowing them to control a computer or a phone just using their mind. Uh, so like you can imagine, like if Stephen Hawking could just mm -hmm. talk uh, and yeah. at, at normal speed or even faster than normal speed. Looking back for the last thousands of years, what is the most important uh, invention of mankind so far? In the past thousand years? Um, I, I guess it's... Millions. <laughs> oh, millions. Um, well, I think language, uh, being able to talk and, and express Express concepts, and um, this this is uh, probably the biggest invention of humanity's language. It's an answer that we like very much in the publishing. Yeah, house. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, writing is yeah, exactly it's just incredible. Uh, writing really made a big difference. Good, that guy Gutenberg, he really knew what he was doing. You have one thing in common with Nikola Tesla. That's a photographic memory. Is that a, only a gift or sometimes a burden because you memorize too much? I have a photographic memory in some respect. Um, you but, uh, <laughs> um, for technical stuff, I have a very good memory. 
This is, so, for a human, yeah, you know, computers are much better at memory. Computers are really good at memory. Why is music so important for you? Techno music in particular? Well, it's pretty fun. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, you want to, I don't know, feel maximum human, you know? And uh, so I think when people have like sort of a rave and good music, it can be you know, like, hey, maximum human, you know? You want to really feel, uh, you know, it's like, like what, what really gets you to feel, you know? And I think that, uh, you know, having fun with friends and, you know, just crazy, crazy dancing is uh, fun. Perhaps you love how techno music is the secret reason why you uh, are building big projects in Berlin. Yeah. Honestly, that's a, it's a significant factor. <laughs> okay, Elon, last question. You, you celebrated your 30th birthday with a masked ball in Venice. 40th. Your 40th yeah. birthday. I was told you had a fight with a samurai uh, sword fighter. What is your plan for your 50th wow, birthday really next year? Well, so my it's, my fortieth birthday was the was in Venice. Uh, it was it was technically a post apocalyptic masked ball because mm. uh, you know after the apocalypse, how much clothing do you really have? You know, <laughs> it's not going to be a little ragged, a little burnt. You know, um, so um, no plans for the fiftieth. Yeah, fiftieth, <laughs> the half century party. I thought um, I have to think of something. Um, usually go with some kind of crazy theme. The 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 the, the party where I where, uh, ended up uh, wrestling with the world champion sumo wrestler, which by the way also caused me to burst a disc in my neck. Uh, <laughs> so you know, five minutes of glory for five years of pain. Um, <laughs> was, was that really hurt? Um, uh, so th that party was. Um, Victorian Japanese steampunk. So that was cool. Uh, I have to think of something for the half century party. You have a little time to think. I mean, hey, being on Earth for a half century. That's like, hey, I'm still alive. Wow, cool. <laughs> okay. Now, one very last question. When I asked you what is the meaning of life uh, during a dinner. 42. You said after a while, after a while well, probably this wonderful French cheese. Could you please explain? Uh, well, I was just saying that, that you know you want to take a moment to appreciate things in life and the sensations. Um, you know, food's incredible, uh, and uh, like there's just so many good things that you can experience. Some of them cost nothing, really. Um, you know, have a walk in nature or uh, just a nice meal, and it's like wow, that's pretty great, you know, and. Uh, We should take a moment to appreciate these, these uh, little things, the big things, um, the things that move your heart. I think that's probably the meaning of life, those close definitions as I